Thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, for coming to this, um, to this session. This is our uh, second keynote, the second keynote of our uh, conference, Rethinking the Afropolitan, the Ethics of Black Atlantic Masculinities on Display. And my name is Laurel Semley, and I'm one of the co-conveners with Professor Rosa Carrasquillo. And it is my pleasure to introduce our, our speaker, Robert Trent Venson, who is the Francis and Edwin Cummins Cummings, Associate Professor of History and Africana Studies at the College of William and Mary. Um, I actually first met Professor Vincent before we were professors, right? I think we were still <laughs> graduate students. So it was a long time ago. I won't tell you how long. Um, and it was at a conference on the African diaspora. And I remember being struck by the nature of his work um, on South Africa that put South Africa within this Atlantic framework. Um, I think we often forget how much South Africa and South Africans participated in these physical and cultural and intellectual flows between, the, between Africa, within Africa, the Americas, and Europe. And in fact, partly because of that, in my own teaching, I always try to include South Africa in unexpected places, right, at different points in uh, the syllabus to uh, show how Africa is part of uh, the continent, and in the Americas and Europe in different kinds of ways. Vincent's groundbreaking uh, book, The Americans Are Coming, The Dream of African American Liberation and Segregationist South Africa, was published in 2012. And it reveals those complex relationships between South Africa and a wider world. In the book, he explores how in the decades before World War II and before the imposition of formal apartheid in South Africa, African Americans and West Indians engaged and inspired um, South Africans in this moment where you have the foundations of an anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, African Americans and West Indians were serving as role, model, role models and liberators, especially the movement of Marcus Garvey. And so his next projects, and he has several, take these, uh, these ideas into new directions. He has one book coming out in the spring of 2018 called Before Mandela, Like a King, The Prophetic Politics of Chief Albert Luthuli. That's still the title, yes. And then he's the co-author of two additional books uh, in preparation, Shaka's Progeny, Zulu Cultures and the Making of a Modern Atlantic World, and, and Crossing the Water, African Americans and South Africa, 1890 to 1965. And he's published very widely in journals and edited volumes. And I asked Robert to come and present some of his latest work at this conference um, after being on a panel with him, um, and also uh, one of our roundtablists, um, Ifeoma Nkwanko, um, recently in New Orleans. And again, I was struck by these connections between South Africa and the Americas, especially, uh, particularly the US. And in this case, he was tracing Zulu identities and different ways in which these notions of being Zulu were used and reused by African Americans and South African activists and artists and imbuing these ideas with different notions of modernity, shared struggle, hinting at ideas of masculinity, mm. right? And, and tracing it in popular culture with references, he began with Oprah Winfrey and he ended with Africa Bambata, right? <laughs> so it was great. So again, I think it, it's imperative for us to include South Africa, right? This is our only paper really dealing with South Africa um, in our discussions that have so far been so wide ranging across time and across space. And his paper today invites us to think about the Afropolitan, again, in these ever expanding contexts. The title of his talk is different. <laughs> his, <laughs> historicizing <laughs> Afropolitanism. Albert Luthuli, Nelson Mandela, and Martin Luther King in South Africa's global anti it's a mouthful. Global anti apartheid struggle. Join me in welcoming Robert Trent Vincent to hold the cross. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Laurel. I'm sorry for throwing you that curveball with the change of the title. And, and Rosa, thank you all for, for having me, for inviting me, for coming. I'm very happy to be here. I had a nice odyssey this morning, driving and flying, getting here from Williamsburg, Virginia. And I'm on a high because my daughter's 15th birthday was yesterday. So that's, so, so I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good about things. So I've got 40 minutes, and I thought, 40 minutes, that's not a lot of time. I'm just going to try to do this very quickly. And I talk faster than I read, so I'm not going to read a paper. I thought I could talk through a PowerPoint quicker and get through all the information quicker. So we're going to hit the ground running. So this is coming out of the book that's coming out in the spring, this, this talk here. And it hints toward the, the project that we were talking about earlier that we had uh, been on the panel at. 
And the title is, is trying to work with this idea of Afropolitanism. How does this work? Where is the place of Africa and African peoples in this, uh, in this very dynamic uh, rethinking that includes the Atlantic world, includes black peoples in motion in different parts of the world? What are the connections? So this talk will center South Africa. It will center three Nobel Peace Prize winners, Albert Latuli, Nelson Mandela, and Martin Luther King. And it will center around an iconic moment, 1961, when the African National Congress, which was, a, which was the leading anti-apartheid organization in South Africa, ended 50 years of exclusive nonviolent struggle to eventually continue nonviolence in many ways, but then make this additional change to adopt armed struggle against the apartheid regime. And that decision had Albert Latuli at the center of it. Latuli, as you will see, had just won the Nobel Peace Prize winner. He had been the president of the African National Congress, and he would be until his death in 1967. And shortly after he returns, the armed struggle begins. So that moment was controversial then. It remains controversial now amongst lay people, ordinary South Africans, and others, and particularly amongst scholars. And so we'll walk through this talk about this particular moment and how these three men in particular impacted on that particular moment. So that's where we're going, all right, in 40 minutes. See what we can do. <laughs> so here is a picture of uh, Chief Albert Latuli. Latuli may be not as well known now. At the time, he was a, a global icon of peace and reconciliation. He was indeed Mandela before Mandela, if you have the idea of Nelson Mandela after he came out of prison in 1990, this sort of icon of racial reconciliation and peace. This was Latuli 30 years earlier. He had, as I mentioned, been the leader of the African National Congress since 1952 and had led the organization and its allies through a number of iconic events, the Defiance Campaign in 1952, a major campaign of civil disobedience in which he is using Gandhian techniques of nonviolence and civil disobedience against the apartheid regime. By the way, after all, Gandhi, who we associate with India, actually worked out his ideas uh, of civil disobedience in South Africa. So this was an African dynamic centered on Africa first and then moves out into India. Latuli becomes South Africa's foremost exponent of Gandhian nonviolence. He continues to lead the ANC through the Freedom Charter, this wonderful charter, this document that says, yes, we're against apartheid, but we're also for a nonviolent uh, and a multiracial democracy. And that's important because that was a revolutionary idea at that time. We're still struggling to find a successful multiracial democracy. In this country, where we think we're so far advanced, we're struggling with that dynamic, particularly at this moment. So for Latuli to make this argument that there could be a multiracial democracy in the context of apartheid South Africa, which at its very basis was arguing for inherent racial separation, and in fact, racial subordination, was a revolutionary idea that I think has been underserved. He perseveres through the 1950s, and he connects these ideas in South Africa to international human rights norms, primarily based on the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. So he's connecting South African events with global events, glo um, developing international human rights norms. He had a multiracial following of Africans, whites, who were against apartheid. There were some, not many, but there were some. Um, Indians, those from the Indian subcontinent, um, and those mixed race people known as coloreds. He had a multiracial following. He had a multi-ideological following. Those who were African nationalists, some who were communist or socialist, right? some who regarded themselves as liberal Christians. So he was a rare unifying figure in South Africa. If South Africa, like much of the African continent, had gotten its independence in the early 1960s, it is more than likely that Latuli would have been its first president. 
But of course, we know that apartheid lasted much longer. Nevertheless, for his leadership, as I briefly described, he wins the Nobel Peace Prize, accepts it in December 12, 1961. And you will notice something here. So much of Afropolitanism focuses on fashion. You will notice a type of hybrid that's happening here. He's in a suit, a Western suit, but he's also wearing an Iziku ne necklace. And the Iziku necklace is given to Zulu warriors who are preparing for battle. And so there's this mix of the so-called Western with the African, right at this moment of accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, I mentioned to you that he wins this award. He gives this speech on December 12, 1961. And he and his wife, Noku Kanya, are flying back into South Africa. On the very night, December 15, 1961, that he and his wife are flying back into South Africa, boom, a new organization known as Unkanto Wisiswe, shorthand, MK, announces this debut. They are engaging in sabotage attacks engaged trying to strike at the infrastructure of the South African state. They want to blow up power lines, railway lines. They want to disrupt business as usual. They want to announce themselves and say, hey, nonviolence, we'd like to continue with that, but we need to go up, step up the game a little bit. So this moment raised questions then and now. And here's the brief historiography. I won't bore you with all the details. Right? Very quickly, I'll say this. The current president in South Africa, Jacob Zuma, makes the argument that Latuli was for the armed struggle. Zuma claims that he was for the armed struggle and that he would be in a position to know because Zuma was a member of Umkantu Wisiswe. And Zuma makes the argument that Latuli, of course, would have been part of the armed struggle. And he plays on the idea that Latuli was a Zulu man and plays on the idea of the Zulu historically being a warrior, martial, military people. And thus, Latuli the Zulu would, of course, take up this struggle. That's one line of thought. Another line of thought argues that after the Sharfield massacre that we'll talk about in 1960, where the South African state killed 69 Africans and wounded about 180, and then declared a state of emergency, and then banned the ANC and other related anti-apartheid organizations, that it was Nelson Mandela a younger Nelson Mandela, who led the charge to take up armed struggle. And they did so by overriding Albert Latuli. One author, Scott Cooper, in his recent biography of Albert Latuli, Bound by Faith, makes the argument that Latuli was essentially overrun, a victim of an internal coup by an insubordinate Nelson Mandela and other rebel cadres who rushed impetuously to armed struggle against the principled objections of Albert Latuli. In this reading, then, there is no room for great nuance. Latuli could not have taken up armed struggle, according to Cooper, because he was bound by faith, his Christian faith, a nonviolent Christian faith that would not allow for any attempt at violence. And so Cooper argues that before during and after the decision to start MK, Latuli was against the armed struggle. And he had to be because he was bound by his Christian faith. Here, in this reading, Latuli is governed by liberal Christianity derived from his American uh, uh, mission education. In my mind, that's a limited view of what actually happened in Latuli's mind. But keep that in mind. He was bound by faith, by his Christian faith, and could not act any other way except against the armed struggle. A third view then argues that, yes, Mandela led the charge to fight against the apartheid regime by creating MK, but he did so not as an African nationalist, but he did so as a tool of Moscow, now, this is based on recent evidence that suggests that Nelson Mandela was a member of the South African Communist Party. And that's a very controversial set of claims in South Africa and beyond. We don't have conclusive evidence that he was a member of the South African Communist Party. 
We know that he attended meetings, but no concrete evidence that he was an actual member. Nevertheless, a recent author, Stephen Ellis, has written a book that suggests that the decision to start MK was not a decision by Vandela and the ANC. It was a decision by the South African Communist Party with their international communist allies centered on Moscow that drove the decision, the pivotal decision, to move to armed struggle. Here then, just as Latuli is bound by a liberal Christian faith, so too is Mandela bound and subordinated to an international communism out of Moscow. In both scenarios, Africa and Africans are decentered and marginalized and subordinated to forces outside the continent. This, these last two views are tied to an argument about contemporary South Africa. It's an argument that comes out of, of a sort of Afro-pessimism, which, in fact, Afro-politics comes as a reaction to. This argument says that the armed struggle was a charade. It was poorly executed, poorly conceived, a strategic mistake, a blunder that delayed the moment of liberation until 1994 because it placed South Africa into the Cold War dynamics. Because after all, MK was getting crucial support from the Soviet Union and to a lesser extent, China. And thus, that became a rationale for the United States and Great Britain and France and other Western powers to continue their support of apartheid South Africa. So the argument goes, the decision to take support from Moscow drew South Africa into a Cold War dynamic and that extended the period of apartheid because apartheid South Africa was getting so much support from the West. Because MK never won a military victory over the South African state, so the argument goes, they had to accept a bad deal, a compromise. A compromise that did not allow for the full economic empowerment of black South Africans. And so thus the argument goes, the dynamics in South Africa today, where still too many black South Africans are mired in poverty, the argument goes that some of this is rooted in a strategic mistake to engage in armed struggle. So it's a type of Afro-pessimism that connects the past to the present to try to explain some of the failings of the current South African state. Okay, so that's the shortest historiographical overview I could have given you, <laughs> you know, because this is a contentious debate, but there it is. So you have that. And now you know the basics of apartheid, right? We don't have to walk through all of that, right? We know that apartheid uh, was from 1948 to 1994. We know that it built on earlier systems of racial segregation. And the point of apartheid and its blizzard of laws was pretty straightforward. It was about white supremacy. It was about a white over black political and socioeconomic and cultural order. It was about social engineering of the separation of races and really more than that, the subordination of the African majority particularly. It was about controlling the urban and rural space. It was about moving Africans from rural areas to urban areas to be integrated into the economy as necessary workers, but separated in that urban space in locations or what we call townships outside of the city, where their movements would be tightly controlled from the township into the city where they would work, the centerpiece of economic activity. And this movement would be regulated and controlled by passes that they would have to carry that would regulate how they could move to the city, how long they could stay, where they could live in the city, and how they could move back and forth from work to home, right? We know all of that basic information, right? And so it was about controlling African movement, controlling African workers, and of course it was about controlling education, primarily through what was known as Bantu education, right? And a, a very clearly defined system of education that was going to prepare Africans for less opportunities in South Africa, and it was explicit, right? So, and ultimately, when, we, when there's resistance to this, we get into a system of a, a type of police state. 
Okay, so those basics we know. And now here's a point that we should point to here. Hendrik Verfurt, who's the Minister of Native Affairs between 1950 and 1958, and the Prime Minister from 1958 to 1966. He's basically the master planner of apartheid, right? He makes a very telling statement in 1950 that I think is important for us. He's making the argument that Bantu or Africans and Europeans or whites cannot live together. A rather pessimistic view of human potential. And he makes the argument here that if you have any type of integration or admixture, by necessity, by necessity, chaos will ensue. Disorder will ensue. Right? And Verifold is missing something here, and I think he's missing sort of the hybridity and the flexibility that we talk about when we talk about Afropolitans. Because those Africans, those so-called native tribal subjects who are supposedly timeless, unchanging over centuries, over time and space, these Bantu peoples who are supposedly inferior, these are people who move easily across ethnic lines, speak many languages. Indeed, in their languages, they may know six or seven. And in fact, create hybrid languages, Vanagabu, Sotsital, that speaks to that hybridity and that flexibility, that ability to move across time and space and to interact with people in different cultural spaces and create new dynamics, and are able to move from townships to whites-only areas, back and forth. And so he's missing that sort of cosmopolitanism that are there every day in African lives. He reduces them to these very simplistic beings, these units of labor who are timeless, never changing. He's missing the potential of South Africa by reducing Africans to such simple beings. So he's missing this dynamic that South Africans at that time spoke of. There's a very famous journal called Drum in the 1950s that spoke about this cosmopolitanism that existed at that time. Right? And this idea then of what South Africa would look like decolonized <coughs> in the African period of decolonization in the late 1950s into the 1960s Hendrik Verwood has this idea of decolonization. And that would be the Bantustans. In Verwood's mind, the land division of South Africa, based on the 1913 Natives Land Act, that stipulated that whites, about 20% of the population, would control about 87% of the land, and Africans, who were about 85% of the population, would only have about 13% of the land, and that means not ownership, but usage of 13%. Verifuit's idea of decolonization, that he's telling the world that, well, we're right in sync with African decolonization. This is how we're doing it. And so we're going to consign these Africans by their ethnicities, right? So that's their primary identity, their ethnicity. And they're going to have their citizenship based in these ethnic-based homelands, or Bantustans. And that's where they should be. Never mind if they were born in cities and had never been to these places before. They're marked by their ethnic identity. That becomes a determining factor of what their natural home is. And in this dynamic of decolonization, then, there's a sleight of hand that's happening now. Because if you're saying that Africans, if a Zulu person, for instance, has their homeland in KwaZulu, then what you're saying is that they can never articulate a demand for citizenship in South Africa itself. So how do you turn a majority into a minority? 85% of the population that are making demands to say that historically, we were here first, and by numbers, we have rights. And as human beings, we have rights. How do you do the sleight of hand? You simply say, your citizenship will not be located in South Africa proper. So forget the political agitation. Your citizenship will be based on your ethnicity and in your homeland. And in South Africa proper now, you are reduced to essentially a guest worker with no rights, who can be deported at any time. Of course, that land is not nearly enough. Of course, this is not 
the idea of Albert Latuli <laughs> about a multiracial South Africa where everyone can live. So oppositional visions are happening here. And with continuing political pressure by the ANC and other anti-apartheid organizations, including the Pan-Africanist Congress, Sharpeville happens March 21st, 1960, where police opened fire on peaceful demonstrators demonstrating against the past laws. Most of them were shot in the back as they were running away from the fire. So was this a moment for Prime Minister Verfuert to say, oh, my bad, we, we overreacted. We overstepped our bounds here. Maybe we need to reconsider what we're doing. The African continent, in fact, Asia and the Caribbean are moving toward decolonization. Maybe we should move in that direction too. Was that what they were saying? Was that what Verfuert said? What do you think? <laughs> Based on what I told you so far, what do you think? <laughs> no, no, okay, all right. Am I alone here? I'm not alone, right? Okay. The response was unapologetic and crystal clear. You have to give it up for these guys on one level. They were not ambiguous about what they were doing. <laughs> they kind of let you know where they stood, right? And some, sometimes there's some value in that. Sometimes you need to know very clearly where you stand, just in case you don't know. And Sharpeville was one of those moments that somehow, magically, if you somehow did not know, <laughs> you were reminded. And again and again and again. And these guys are very clear. These government officials are very clear. The Minister of Defense, the Minister of Justice, are very clear about what they're doing. As they militarize, as they become the most powerful military on the African continent, they're very clear about who the primary enemy, enemy is. It's not some external threat, some foreign country. It's the African majority that they regard as their primary threat. Right? So this is what we're dealing with in apartheid South Africa. And after Sharpeville, not only is there not a mea culpa, but there's a banning of anti-apartheid organizations, including the African National Congress. So at this moment then, in the state of emergency in the bannings of 1960 into 1961, the question becomes, Albert Latuli, you're a wonderful person, wonderful ideas, you're a visionary, you're a revolutionary in how you're thinking about humanity. But your methods of Gandhian nonviolence, as wonderful as they are, they're not working here in South Africa. And so the ideas of taking up alternate means of struggle, armed struggle, accelerate. And Nelson Mandela is leading that charge. And so it's at this critical moment then that some feel that these methods are obsolete, that Latuli is bound by Christian faith to act in a different manner. But archival evidence in South Africa and in the United States, including some previously uh, uh, previously unused papers altogether, show that Latuli actually had a harder-edged activism, that he wasn't a solely a Christian pacifist. In fact, he wasn't a pacifist at all. And that he tapped into more liberationist, more aggressive forms of Christianity that allowed for just means, that allowed for some form of self-defense. Here, 1954, Albert Latuli who, having toured the U.S. South in 1948, primarily to link up with African Americans, to compare the African American struggle against Jim Crow with what South Africans were dealing with. He takes this trip, he vis goes throughout the South, visits a number of historically black colleges and universities, including Howard, Virginia State, and, and Tuskegee, and Talladega. And he's taking notes about how African Americans are dealing with Jim Crow, looking at their progress, looking at their disabilities. And he comes back in early 1949 to a South Africa that has now instituted apartheid and is now connecting that more firmly with American Jim Crow. In other words, he's more attuned to a global color line. And he understands that the South African struggle is not in isolation. He understood that, I think, in the abstract. 
but to actually visit, to actually be Jim Crow himself, denied, forced to sit in Jim Crow conditions on trains, be denied service in restaurants, to see that firsthand then. He's taking that larger consciousness into his activism as ANC president. And he was particularly interested in the 246 years of American slavery. And he was particularly interested in the Civil War and anti-abolitionist activity just before the Civil War. And he was most interested in a character named John Brown. Do we know John Brown? Well, talk to me. <laughs> Who is John Brown? What do you think? Do you agree? Mm. <laughs> so. Although uh, Douglas was careful, Frederick Douglass was careful in the way of So this is the moment where you know we would sort of get into a Socratic dialogue to talk about what do you think, but we only have 40 minutes, so we're going to move forward, right? So John Brown was actually a white abolitionist who spoke the language of Christianity but an apocalyptic Christianity, right? He wasn't alone in this. There were many black and white Christians who read the Bible, the Old Testament, Exodus, let my people go, the old Israelites, but also read Revelation very carefully and understood that there would be divine judgment on those who acted against God's word. And there was a strong belief that God did not countenance slavery that there was an equality of believers, there was an equality of humanity. And so those slaveholders were violating not only some moral, earthly moral law, but more particularly God's law. And 246 years meant that there would be divine judgment and vengeance on those slaveholders. And John Brown and other abolitionists acted on that in 1859 in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Right? And so we know that story, right? And we find Latuli referencing John Brown, Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He's connecting American slavery to South African apartheid. In fact, he references South African apartheid as a form of slavery. That's one common referent. The other common referent is that South Africa is a continuation of fascist Nazi Germany. So that's like the trinity that he's connecting, American slavery, Nazi Germany, apartheid Africa, as forms of evil that need to be abolished from the earth. Right? 1957 and 1960, as Latuli is writing his autobiography titled Let My People Go, again, coming out of Exodus, his compiler, because he did this by interviews, Charles Hooper, talked with Latuli about this question of armed self-defense. And Hooper later wrote that this is what Latuli was coming at. There was occasion for morally defensible aggression when you were being attacked. And he's referencing his own Zulu background, growing up as a child using stick fighting as a form of self-defense, that this would be an acceptable form, armed self-defense, when you're attacked. When someone comes into your home, a madman comes into your home, and, you're, and someone is threatening your family, of course you're going to react to that. That's how he regarded apartheid's henchmen, as madmen, coming into the house of South Africa, disrupting and destroying. And thus, in these conditions now, when 50 years of nonviolence had produced no results, there was space now for armed self-defense. Latuli now is freed from this Christian pacifism that supposedly immobilizes him from acting in any other way beyond nonviolence, right? And he's very important here. It's the conditions that have been changing in this post shotville moment, right? Now, where does Nelson Mandela fit into all of this? Nelson Mandela had been a longtime ANC member one of the top leaders in the ANC. And he is one of these people pushing. In fact, he's the leader since the early 1950s, 
pushing for some type of armed struggle. He feels it's inevitable. In fact, he had sought assistance from China and the Soviet Union as early as 1953. He understood that there would be no support coming from the West, even in those early years, the United States and Great Britain and other Western powers had supported apartheid South Africa. They had done so primarily because they wanted access to uranium, which is what you need for nuclear weaponry. Right? That was the primary reason that we sided with the apartheid regime. Right? So it's Mandela now who is pushing this idea. And Ellis, as I mentioned to you earlier, Stephen Ellis makes the argument that Mandela is pushing toward MK, not in service of the ANC, but in service of international communism. And again now, we take away the agency of African peoples now by centering the dynamic action outside of Africa with non-African actors. Now Mandela is reduced to being a tool. My work and other people's work, particularly Paul Landau, shows that it was Mandela and many others within the ANC who were plotting the course toward armed struggle as early as 1952 without any type of communist leadership. They did not need that prompt, right? And so that's a change because we've often thought about the MK moment as happening just after Sharpeville, as a reaction to Sharpeville. But there was an understanding much earlier that this was inevitable, that the apartheid regime was so intractable, so hostile, that ultimately there would come a day when armed struggle would be necessary, when in fact nonviolent protest, the ANC itself, would be banned altogether. So they anticipated that on their own. They didn't need the Communist Party to tell them that. There are those like Ellis who emphasize that Mandela's influence was, influences toward armed struggle, his inf inspirational examples toward armed struggle were outside the African continent. Yes, it's true in 1954 that Africans were chanting Den Ben Phu after the Vietnamese defeated the French in that major battle in 1954. Yes, they drew inspiration, ultimately, from Cuba, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara overturning the Batista regime in Cuba. But I think what we miss in that are African inspirational examples. The anti-colonial struggle in Algeria, the Kenya Land and Freedom Party in Kenya against British colonialism. And more specifically, 19th century anti-colonial wars of resistance, including in South Africa. And more immediately, rural rebellions in South Africa from the late 1950s into the 1960s that were pushing the ANC to take a more militant stance. But if we focus the action outside of Africa, or when we look at Africa in cities, we miss the rural rebellions in South Africa that were the immediate impetus pushing Mandela and others in the ANC toward armed struggle. Right. We now come to the pivotal meetings in July 1961 that actually take the decision to move to MK. This, these meetings had been previously sort of shrouded in mystery. What actually happened? Now that 1994 happened, and a number of participants in these struggles who could not write before because of the precedence of the regime wrote the memoirs about what happened. We've also been able to uncover some archival documents and a slew of oral interviews. Allow us to reconstruct this moment. And to cut to the chase, in 10 minutes we're going to finish this thing. To cut to the chase, there were three different meetings, two within the ANC, one with the ANC leadership and their Congress Alliance, multiracial partners. So there were Indian organizations, there were communist organizations, right? there were a range of different organizations that were allied in this Congress Alliance, a sort of multiracial, multi-ideological, anti-apartheid coalition. And they meet in Groutville this rural area where Albert Latuli lives. So the center of action again is happening in a rural area, not in the city. And in these meetings, there's a back and forth. And Latuli initially says, no, we need to stay with nonviolence. This is the most powerful military on earth. We're going to be fighting on their terms, on their terrain. 
And the only way we can engage this war is if we have enough weaponry to have a reasonable chance of success. And until that happens, it's foolhardy. And it's irresponsible for our, for our members who joined the ANC based on the idea that we were nonviolent. We're exposing them to whatever retribution the state wants to deliver upon them. And we have no arms. It's foolhardy to take this up. I see your point, but it's going to be difficult to do this. Mandela makes the argument that 50 years of nonviolent struggle have not worked. They're banned at the moment. They can't even protest legally that they have to do something. And in this back and forth across these three meetings, a compromise is made. Batuli says, hey, we can't take a decision on our own to move to armed struggle without consulting our membership. It's undemocratic to do it that way, and it's irresponsible in the ways I've described. But you, Mandela, and those who agree with you, fine. You start your own organization. Umkanto we Siswe, MK. If you have support, you have military support, you think you can execute and win this struggle, fine, go forward. I cannot turn the ANC into violence. It would be irresponsible for me as a leader. But I authorize you to start this separate organization, MK, and I want you to keep reporting to me. And I don't want a conscious loss of life here. I want you to attack the infrastructure of South Africa. I want you to hit the power lines. I want you to hit the, the transportation links. I want you to hurt the economy of South Africa. But I don't want a loss of life. So you have to be surgical in how you engage this struggle. So here is Latuli now, showing the flexibility, the adaptability to say, hey, we're going to continue with nonviolence, but we're adding these other forms of struggle, and we want to coordinate them and leverage them in such a way that we maximize our chances of overturning the apartheid regime, or at the very least, bringing them to the negotiating table. Right? So here is a Latuli now who is thinking through the best way out of this very difficult situation. And we have evidence of him talking about MK after it's actually formed in November 1961. Three months after the decision was made, and a month before he's about to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Here he is threading a very thin needle, as he says to an MK commander. And that commander, and that person's name was uh, Fred Dubé, said, we've established this thing, and this is Latuli's response. So you can read it for yourself. We have more evidence along these lines. This is just an example. Right? Note two, his, ver his idea of Christianity. I will not be just like Christ and turn the other cheek. Again, he's not bound <laughs> by this idea of Christian pacifism. Right? Okay, so five minutes and we come to the close here. Now the short-term consequences were dire for MK and for the ANC. The state cracked down with legislation, with police power. By 1964, the majority of MK personnel in South Africa including Mandela, are in jail, or dead, or exiled. Latuli himself is faced with increasingly harsh bans. He's basically under house arrest. So the short-term consequences were not particularly uh, favorable to the ANC and MK. And as I mentioned before, the support from the Soviet Union and the Chinese placed this dynamic place this dynamic into a Cold War um, um, situation. But as we come to the close here, Latuli adjusts again. As Mandela and others are going to jail in the famous Ravonia trial, he accelerates his idea now of international nonviolence. Here Latuli is making the argument, now we're going to engage in a type of nonviolence that will bring in international actors who want to support us by boycotts, by ex supporting economic sanctions, by supporting embargoes of any South African goods, right? That this is the way that a global anti-apartheid movement could take off. An international force now, a people of goodwill, 
who want to move against the apartheid regime. That form of international nonviolence is shared by his fellow Nobel Peace Prize winner, Martin Luther King. In 1964, King wins the Nobel Peace Prize. And King makes a tragic mistake. If you ever win an award, you must, you must, you must first thank your spouse. And then you bring your mother and your father and whoever else into play, right? King doesn't do this with Coretta. He doesn't mention Coretta at all. The, name, the only name he mentions in his Nobel acceptance speech, Albert Latuli. And here, this is important, I think. You grasp it, right? Because when we look at the Afropolitan, we tend to focus, focus again on black people in motion outside of Africa and sometimes those in the diaspora altogether, right? And so Africa tends to drop out. Africa and Africans tend to drop out of the story. And when we look at black people in the diaspora, we look at them as the center of the action. Here King, the famous Martin Luther King, is saying, if I lived in South Africa, I would be a follower of Latuli. I believe in his methods of international nonviolence. I want to take up that mantle. So we move King out of this domestic civil rights dreamscape, right? I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream to remember that King, too, was deeply engaged with what was happening on the African continent, very much interested in African decolonization. Remember, he attended the independence ceremonies in Ghana in 1957. He was there in 1960 when Nigeria got its independence. Right? He met with African leaders regularly. King understood that domestic civil rights was connected to other struggles for racial justice, just as Latuli had done 12 years earlier. So those connections are there with King taking the mantle of international nonviolence from Latuli and going further with it. Ultimately, in the 1980s, this strategy of sanctions, boycotts, embargoes becomes a groundswell of activity that eventually forces the United States to change its foreign policy in 1986, to finally act against apartheid, other Western countries to finally act against apartheid, and finally brings apartheid South Africa to the negotiating table by 1990, creating the conditions now where that person, Nelson Mandela, can walk out of jail and don that mantle of international statesmanship, using the template that we did not realize of Albert Latuli 30 years earlier. So these are, these are the connections that perhaps we have not always made. We look at King here making these arguments, showing these connections, how he is interested in this larger struggle, how King too, like Latuli, is using other reference points from around the world, calling apartheid a medieval segregation, a sophisticated form of slavery. Here, too, King is using Exodus 9-1, let my people go, in a major speech he makes against apartheid South Africa in 1967. Let my people go, a trope shared by Albert Latuli in his autobiography and King in his major address against South African apartheid. The last slide here, Latuli, the Afropolitan, again, I started with fashion, a brief nod to this, I'm no expert in this, but here Latuli at his daughter's wedding, again, working with the idea of protection, the Zulu warrior engaged in a type of stick fighting, but really as a form of protection. Here he is in a suit, but also with the shield, with traditional Zulu military armaments. So Latuli, again, mixing his dress in such a way that's underappreciated by previous scholars who straightjacket him as a man overtly influenced just by the West. African Afropolitanism, I think, reminds me of some of the debates that we were having when African diaspora studies was taking off maybe 15 or so years ago. It was focused on the diaspora and not Africa itself. And still today, 
when African diaspora studies, we still, where's the Africa in Africans? Where is the movement and migration of peoples, yes, in Africa? Why does it always have to be outside of Africa for us to take notice? So I think when we talk about this struggle, for instance, we focus on African self-determination. And don't look for external influences like international Christianity or communism. When we talk about Africans of the world, it doesn't have to be when they step outside the African continent. Africa is a very big continent <laughs> with many people. <laughs> and there's a lot of action happening in the continent itself. So when we talk about Africans in the world, we can center Africa and Africans. And I think we can historicize this idea of Afropolitanism beyond, beyond literary and cultural and post-colonial studies. I think we have enough historical examples to deepen what we're thinking about when we talk about Afropolitanism. Even though those historical subjects that we're talking about did not call themselves Afropolitans, we did not have that term then, I think when we look at history and some of these examples, I think that can help bring us further down the road as we develop this exciting new field of study called Afropolitanism. I hope I kept close to my time. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Yes, yes, please. Yes, and so that's, that's a wonderful question because that, that is the, the dynamic, and that's the framework that I have historically used, that these are pan-African movements and ideas and actions that are happening. And I think that's one of the dynamics that are missing when we talk about Afropolitanism. We tend to focus on consumer, consumerism or commodification or you know, some, but there's, where's the politics and where's the history, right? So that, I think, we still have to work with this dynamic, right? So when we use the term Afropolitanism, are we simply relabeling <laughs> sort of you know, more familiar dynamics? And where's the usefulness in that? And I'm still working that out myself. Like, are we, are, is this just a fashionable thing to relabel and market? But there, there are politics here, and I think we can incorporate those pan-African politics when we think about Afropolitanism. Yeah. But I, one of the questions I've been wrestling with is whether it's a transhistorical notion with different kinds of variations and versions across history. Mm -hmm. That, that is, uh, there's a more recent um, naming, labeling mm -hmm. with a particular kind of investment at a particular moment in history, or whether it has its precursors, uh, and whether there are relationships between these different labels for similar kinds of engagements. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, that is the question to have. So Pan-Africanism, as I understand it, starts with this basic idea, right, that the, the, the destiny of Africa and Africans and African-descended peoples outside continental Africa are linked by historical events, by contemporary events, and particularly uh, um, during the period of colonialism, right? Uh, that these were sort of an com overarching commonality that you could speak to. And thus, with a broadly shared history and a broadly shared present, there was a broadly shared destiny. And that required a type of cooperation and common identification to maximize the chances of individual and collective liberation, however that was defined, right? Okay, so in this moment now, when we're talking about um, at least... Uh, constitutionally, a decolonized black world, and supposedly, legally, a post-civil rights America, for instance, right? It becomes a bit harder now to say, okay, where are the drawing points? Where, where are we going to link up? There are ways to do it, obviously, but it's not as obvious, right? And so now I think that creates a space now for, let's say, ideas where 
or, or showing us connection where the politics can drop out a bit unless you're conscious of all the political dynamics still at play. So I think that's a, almost a crisis of Pan-Africanism now saying, okay, what are the common reference points? Where are we moving? And I think that's a question with Afropolitanism. And what's the connection between these two movements? So I think that's like an open question still. So then, at that time in the 1950s, th this drum generation that I met, mostly uh, journalists, writers, who were writing, and they were using the term cosmopolitan. When they used the term, they used it. But they, they, it was remarkable that they um, did not of, often reference these terms like cosmopolitanism because they thought it was sort of commonplace. It was unremarkable that they could move across so-called linguistic barriers or ethnic barriers, what have you, that there was nothing much to remark upon except to share this with apartheid's rulers to say, look at your folly, right? So that was the, the argument that they were making. Now, their argument was based on cities, though. They were making the argument that there was an urbanity that, that they had, that there was, there was a disconnect between the urban and the rural for them. They had grown up in the cities. They saw no, nothing of value um, in this sort of indigenization and, and rural spaces based on what the apartheid regime wanted to do with them. Um, so that was the response, basically, with that dynamic. But it's in, it was in response to what the regime was trying to do in this type of indigenization. Uh, so that's the first part in terms of how the responses were then. A small commonality with Pan-Africanism and Afropolitanism is, is this actually shared preoccupation with the West? There's a danger with Pan-Africanism. There's an undercurrent this, this, that your reference points are in relation to and opposition to what has happened um, uh, from Western powers, for instance, colonialism, slavery, right, Jim Crow. And that it becomes harder then to say, okay, what are we for if it's not in opposition to Western impositions, right? And that's been some of the difficulties of Pan-Africanism when the more overt features of colonialism or legal discrimination recede, it, it becomes a tricky moment to say, okay, what are we for again if it's not in reference to Western imposition? And so I think that's the common dynamic with the Afropolitan too, is that the West remains the sort of the reference point in opposition to, right? And if you're forming your identity based on something in opposition to, you're always going to be in trouble. You're going to be reliant on the very thing that you say that you're in opposition to. It's almost a type of dependency, right? And so it really becomes important to say, okay, what's our own self-reference? Can we be Afropolitans without reference to? And so that's part of my dynamic. And maybe the answer is no, perhaps, but I'm thinking to myself, you know, that if we, again, sort of center Africa itself, like the Afropolitan doesn't begin when they step out of, you know, into the Atlantic Ocean, into the Atlantic world, right? Does, yeah, I mean, the, so do you think that Afropolitanism cannot exist without reference to the West? I think that's how it's been constructed. Yeah, right. I think we're in agreement here that, yes, that's how it's been constructed. Can we imagine a different construction? Something else, yeah. So I think it's instructive that against those who say Mandela was enthralled, to, to Moscow is that he really is using the resources available through international communism for this vision of MK. It's instructive that he leaves South Africa without a passport, so this is illegal now, right? He doesn't go to Moscow. I mean, he and Lutuli are in sync on this. He spends the first six months of 1962 touring African countries, trying to get military support, logistical support, financial support because he sees the South African struggle um, against ideas of South African exceptionalism that still exists, particularly in South Africa, that South Africa is within the African continent, that, and Lutuli is there too, that you can't separate the two, and there has to be coordination and cooperation on the African continent. It's instructive that the ANC in exile um, has a few years in London, and then sort of reconstituted, and then comes to Lusaka and in, and in Dar, right? That it has to be centered in Africa itself. So I think there's space there to say, we can talk about the dynamics that we talk about, movement, hybridity, et cetera, amongst Africans on the African continent.
and still use other points outside Africa as reference points, perhaps, but not the center of action. And I think the framework in some writing is reversed, where Africa becomes the reference point, the j- jumping on, off point, and then we're talking about other spaces and other places. You know? So I, I think that we can play with that. Um, but that's the beauty of something that's still developing. We argue about it, we debate it, we might throw it out and say, okay, it's not useful. Like, it's maybe too constraining instead of liberating. Like, we don't need to label it all, right? So I think that's wonderful. Like, it's still an open question. You know, that Malcolm X, you know, three times in 1964, he's on the African continent, right? He, he is very engaged and attuned to the politics on the African continent. He's looking at it as a type of inspiration, as a possible role model. So instead of the organization of African unity, he's establishing the organization of Afro-American unity when he comes back, right? He wants to charge the United States with genocide in the courts of the UN, and he wants the support of African countries, right? So, you know, that we reverse the framework. The familiar framework is that the diaspora is in charge of pan-Africanism, and certainly that's not the case after World War II, right? Um, and, and so, yes, Malcolm X and that whole generation, Folk and SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, several of them go to Africa on a trip sponsored by Harry Belafonte, and they're deeply inspired by what's happening on the Africa, the promise of what's happening, and they see those politics as being connected, right? And so there, there's so much more work to be done on this dynamic um, of action happening, of, of diasporic populations going to Ghana or Tanzania, right, and living there, right? Um, of the few thousand African Americans who are in South Africa today alone, right, like living there. Like, what's, what's happening? So when we talk about movement, right, right, the Afropolitan can also be, perhaps, the diasporic person who comes back to Africa, moves into Africa, and moving in these spaces, and it has this hybridity, right? But we don't talk about that dynamic much because it's, 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 it seems to be a sort of, you know, going out of Africa, going out, going out, going out, and then the action begins. And that starts from when we talk about the Atlantic slave trade, for instance, it's always about a going out, and even before slave trades going out, and then things happen, and Africa sort of remains stuck, <laughs> timeless. And, and there, there are active debates on how exceptional South Africa is, right? You know, so people like uh, Mamdani has made the argument that, no, it's actually more similar <laughs> to colonial Africa. Um, and others who still hold on, particularly in South Africa, hold on to some idea of South African exceptionalism. That's a long, in some ways, tire, tiresome debate, particularly in South Africa. But, Okay, <laughs> this is being taped, so if they, people in South Africa see that, they'll be angry at me, but that's okay. <laughs> so, but here's the, here's the point. In the shorthand, I think there's something to it, and I think it, it, it matters that this was the largest uh, settler population, white settler population on the African continent. These are people that, unlike even British-descended people in South Africa, who felt like, look, if things are really bad, we still have our ties with England, we still have family there, we still have people there. Um, these Afrikaners, these Dutch-descended people, had been gone for so long, and they felt themselves to be separated from the Netherlands. They didn't feel like they could go home, per se. They still celebrated the historic and cultural ties, but it wasn't to the extent that they felt, okay, if things get really rough here, we're gone. So as early as uh, the late 17th century, we see these folk coming from the Netherlands, settling in the Cape Colony, and we see them referring to themselves as Afrikaners. That's fairly early. That's like first then second generation. People are born there. So from a very early period, they're regarding themselves as Africans. That's what it means in Afrikaans, right? That this is their home. And they make all sorts of <laughs> ideas of empty land thesis that this is their land. This is their land. This is their country. And Africans are just uh, part of the real estate that they own. Africans are property that they can move around like chess pieces. So they have that sense of ownership. And they have that sense of a minority status that is besieged. That's in what they call a lager, surrounded by hostile majorities, right, who would throw them into the sea if they didn't keep them down in a harsh way. So apartheid becomes this idea of necessity, that we have to do this. We have to maintain the system because we're a besieged minority, and we have these majorities who don't recognize that we are the owners of this land. So we have to take these measures. And that, I think, is why we get apartheid in the, in the way that it plays out. And that's why they hold on for so long, because they lack imagination 
that they too can exist in South Africa in coexistence, in peaceful coexistence. So they ignore the clarion call of someone like Latuli, right? They can't comprehend it, right? So what he's saying is actually really revolutionary and it's alien to them, right? And so they're the ones who are stuck in almost like a timeless, <coughs> unchanging dynamic that they suggested Africans were, were in, right? They're the ones stuck. They're the ones who can't evolve in their thinking, imagine possibilities, right? And that's the tragedy. That's the tragedy. Um, not, not just for the, the, the African majority and Indians and colors who had to deal with the, their, the, their lack of imagination, but then themselves too were dehumanized by this. So I think that that goes some way to getting to why apartheid in this way. Because, uh, uh, I know the meeting, uh, at least one that took place in mm. uh, Buenos Aires, mm. where the uh, leaders of the apartheid regime uh, were, were there discussing the possibility of having stays there. Uh, should they need to relocate? Right. And, and some did come during the South Af yeah, and, and early part of the last century. Uh, there were some who, who left. When the British, so the Afrikaners and the British fought a war against each other in 1900, primarily over gold and diamonds, right? Okay, so you know all that, right? And so some left, right? And, and some are still in Argentina. Some were scattered in different places, held in uh, 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 prison camps, right? So yeah, you still find these communities that are still in some ways self-contained, like, you know. So in America, the slaveholder used, right, selective passages in the Bible that seem to sanction slavery, right? Right, <laughs> they're very selective, right? And they create this whole hermetic hypothesis of Ham right? and being cursed, all right? So you got all that, right? Um, and South Africa, particularly Afrikaners, made broadly similar arguments that uh, they were the elect, the chosen people, if you will, right? And this is sort of the Calvinist strain, right? That they were chosen people, um, they were elect, and they were the damned, right? And the damned were Africans, right? And so they were actually benevolent Christians, and allowing the damned to be in contact with civilization. And so thus, um, slavery, which existed in South Africa from 1652 to 1834, legal slavery, and then other forms of servitude afterwards, um, and then segregation and then apartheid, is, is generally um, um, justified by this civilizing narrative that the African is lazy and indolent and will not work, and needs to be disciplined, right? And in being disciplined to work, um, you are also being civilized, right? So it's the same dynamics, it's the same civilizing narrative. And so no one is thinking of themselves as oppressive people, right? They're regarding themselves as benevolent people that need to civilize the natives, right? And so Bantu education is making this argument explicitly. It's saying, look, don't expect to be integrated into the society, don't expect to have a certain level uh, of civilization to us. We, we will always be your superiors. You will just have an education well enough to serve us, to be able to speak Afrikaans, to learn rudimentary math and English, just to be able to serve us more efficiently. So that's the thing that made apartheid ultimately look sort of out of step with much of the world because it was so overt and unapologetic in their claim that we are educating you for inferiority. Now, we know similar dynamics have happening around the world, but there were other, other examples were less explicit. These guys were very explicit. So it's a very similar dynamic. Like, you can connect the dots and say, yeah, broadly similar justifying ideals, and Christianity is in the center of that. And we see this with some treatments of Latuli that sort of straightjacket him into a certain type of Christianity and shows him just in action with liberal whites, right, or pacifist Christians. So there are echoes of that still existing. Look at Latuli. So yeah, the, the commonalities are just so striking, right? And you know, black folk were making these connections to say, oh, yeah, that's familiar. It's like this moment of recognition. Yeah, that's familiar. And that undergirds the Pan-African project, like that recognition of broad similarities, despite very real differences that folk may have. Right? So, yeah. Thank you so much for your Thank you. Thank you.